Oh, yeah? Like, legit? Well, good morning, everyone. How is everyone this morning? Fine? Well, hey, I have a, uh, we're going to start out this morning. Uh, we have had a lot of things happen over our weekend here. Um, and uh, we're going to start out this morning with prayer together. Uh, the scripture tells us that when two or three people gather, that he's there in the midst. Amen. Amen. And the power of Jesus Christ so oftentimes is limited because we limit it. And instead of bringing our needs immediately to the Lord, we try to solve things in our own, uh, our, our own thought process, or our own ability levels. And by the time it's all done, we've, we've worn ourselves out and we've accomplished nothing to the end result of the prayer. And so this morning, I want us, if you would, to just stand where you are. And we're going to pray. This morning, uh, we, we want to be in prayer for uh, the Goodwin family. Uh, Midge Olive passed away yesterday morning early. And uh, that's a, a tough thing for them. You that know them know that their family is super close. And that when one hurts, they all hurt. And uh, so we want to just be in prayer for them this morning uh, as they deal with that loss. On the opposite side of that, Kara is doing very well. She is, uh, could be released from the hospital as early as today. Uh, out of ICU yesterday, off of oxygen yesterday. And so God is great and he's faithful. And then also we want to be in prayer uh, for... Uh, Excuse me. I want to be in prayer. Uh, goodness, for Miss Irene's nephew, and you didn't tell me his name, but for, for their family, he passed away. Gary. Jerry, sorry. Uh, he passed away uh, just rather suddenly. And uh, so we want to pray for them as well. And folks, I want to tell you something about the peace of God that happens is that when God moves into a situation, no matter how hard the hurt, no matter how devastating it might seem to us, God begins to do something truly miraculous, which means that he begins to come in and comfort us. And it's a comfort that we can't understand. We can just simply feel it and experience it. It is something that God gives us because he knows we need it. And this morning also I want to pray for uh, Bill uh, Krocek, uh, they're still in the house. And uh, folks, I want to tell you, to me, that was, it, I've had two houses in my life, or one house in my life that I bought. I've had, this, or two, I've been living in one now. But the first one, it was mind racking to me and my, uh, just unnerving to try to sell and put it on the market and hope somebody likes it, and purchases it, and does all that. Uh, so we're going to believe God that he is going to move in that. And uh, one of the coolest things that happened to us is that when we said, okay, God, whatever you want us to do, we'll do it. And we put our house on the market in a dead real estate month and our house sold within a month. And uh, it was truly miraculous. Even the realtors said it was miraculous that it actually sold. And so I want to pray for Krochak that that house sells. And then also pray for the Goodwin family and uh, pray for Miss Irene and the West and, and their family and the Hawkins. We're just going to believe that God is going to move in each one of those situations this morning. And so if you'd agree with that this morning, that God can move in each of those situations, would you just put your hand in the air just as a sign that this is what we believe. We, we agree together this morning. Let's pray right now. Just pray out loud. Pray in your own way right now. We're just going to believe that God is going to move in these 
these situations and these circumstances. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning knowing that you are a God who hears and sees everything that we are experiencing and everything that we're going through. And this morning, God, we ask you to move in each one of these situations. Father, we we pray for Jerry's family, God. We, we pray that you would just come in and comfort them uh, through this sudden loss. And God, we ask that you would just move right now. Let your spirit of, of comfort just move through. Let them feel your peace and your grace. God, we pray for the Olive family, God. We, we pray for the good ones, God, as they're dealing with the loss. God, we know that you are there for them. You know, we know, God, that they love you. We know, God, that they depend on you. And so, Father, show yourself to them today that they would feel your peace, that they would feel your hand working right now. And, God, we pray, Lord Jesus, for the crow checks. God, we pray that you would give them peace of mind, that you would give them a, a peace in their heart that this is going to work, that this is going to, that this house will sell. And God, we give you thanks for it, God, because it's going to sell. And God, they're going to give you the glory for it. And God, today, Lord Jesus, we just come before you thanking you that you are a God who does not leave us. You are a God who does not forsake us. You are a God who does not uh, walk away from us and expect us to, to just uh, seek after a God that's ever moving. But, Lord, you're right there, and you're there to walk with us and to help us and to guide us and to carry us. And so this morning, God, as we come before you as a congregation, Lord Jesus, we agree in prayer for all of these needs this morning. Father, for the sick that are in this building this morning, God, I pray that you would touch them, that you would heal their body right now. Lord, any ache, any impairment, any infirmity, Father, heal it right now. Lord Jesus, and we'll give you the thanks for it and the praise for it, Lord. Nothing is outside of your control. Nothing is outside of your reach. And God, we give you thanks for it in your mighty name. Lord, this morning we trade our sorrows and we give them to you. God, we trade our sickness and we give it to you. We lay it all down at the altar, Lord, and we say it is your glory that we want. That's all. Lord Jesus, we lay it down. We take captive every thought and every action. Father, we give you the thanks for your healing touch. We give you thanks for your comfort and your mighty and your holy name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Let's worship together this morning. Start with this. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Trading my 
lift up our hands. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. Together we sing.
just because the music dropped out. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We sing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. It doesn't matter what it sounds like to whoever's next to us or to our own ears, but God wants to hear it. Told you about my friend Marcia who claims she only has one note. And when that one note would come, she would just lay her head back and her arms back and she would just sing that one note to God. And God revealed to her she had more than one note that she could sing. So what have you not stretched out for God yet? Challenge you to lay your head back tonight, or this morning, I'm sorry. Put your arms up, raise towards God. What do you have for me this morning, God? What more can I do for you, Lord? Use me, God. Here I am, a willing vessel in front of you, Lord. Show me my potential this morning, Lord. What more can I do for your kingdom, God? What gifts have you given me that I haven't used yet, Lord? Oh, give me more than just one note, Lord. We praise you, God. We love you, Lord. You are so holy. You are so worthy. We praise you, God.
Today we believe in you. Lord, you are the name that is above every name. You are the creator of the universe. You are the almighty God. And Lord, we worship you today. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your hand in our life, for your working in our hearts and in our minds. And Lord, we just give you thanks today, God give you praise. Lord, we believe in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done. Lord Jesus, thank you. We pray it in your mighty name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. This morning, we are, uh, this is, I've been looking forward to this Sunday for about a month now, a little over a month, and uh, we are into the last Sunday of our push for our one-day Sunday, and uh, before we go into that, uh, we want to 
just take our regular tithes and offerings this morning. I want to ask our ushers if they would to come forward this morning. And uh, if you are raising, uh, if you are um, writing your one day Sunday offering in on your check this morning, please uh, go ahead and make sure that's clearly noted uh, so we can get that where it needs to go. It's kind of exciting because our one day Sunday offering today actually goes through our BGMC, uh, which is great. We I called and talked to a couple of people down at Convoy of Hope, and I said, so <clears throat> what about BGMC? I said, can, can we do that as a special project through Convoy of Hope? And they said, you bet, we got a number. And uh, so they sent us a form, and we were able to, to actually put that offering, our one day Sunday offering will go through our BGMC, and so our BGMC offering today will go to Convoy of Hope, and we still have BGMC. Uh, so it's a, it's a really cool opportunity for our kids to give and for our adults to give too. Uh, today, as far as our regular tithes and offerings, folks, I just want you to know uh, this church has experienced a lot of financial miracles over the past year. And uh, from where we were to where we are now, uh, is amazing to me. Now, what that does to me, I, I told someone I was going to say that today because, uh, and he said, well, if you know, if you say that, then folks are going to get comfortable and they're like, I don't have to give anymore because uh, everything's all good. Uh, that's not why we give in the first place, right? Okay, two of us agree. <laughs> we don't give just so we give money to say we gave money, right? We give as we're giving to the Lord and the church is the opera the, is the way that we are able to outreach into our community and folks we have been do, doing some great outreach uh, our church is now a member of the chamber of commerce in washington and uh, uh what does that mean what that means is that we get about three thousand dollars worth of advertisement for our church for free by the city and so the city is actually promoting our church amen I guess I'm the only one that's really excited about that. What that means is that any new people that come into the city of Washington will receive a, a pamphlet, a, a packet from the Chamber of Commerce. And then the Chamber of Commerce, it has houses of worship. We're first on the list because we're alphabetical. And... Uh, but they have that, they have our website, they actually promote our website, they promote our Facebook page, they do all of that. It's exciting times to be able to minister and, and to connect with people through the chamber. It's a great opportunity for us and we're happy to do it. And then also, uh, to be able to do outreaches into the community. Uh, I was uh, this past week at the city jail, or the county jail, not as an inmate, but as a tourer, I toured it. Wow, Bill. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate your vote of confidence, Bill. <laughs> but um, while we were there, I started talking to some of the law enforcement officers, and I, I said, so what can we do as a church to help you and to help these people that are incarcerated? What can we do? And they said, you need to be present. So many times people will leave the doors of a prison and they will go out and they will repeat because they cannot connect to another community. They're back into the way they used to be, the people that they used to run with. Folks, we need to be there for them. And so what I have been talking to the police department, I don't have them convinced yet, but when they have a release, they're going to let me know and we're going to begin to talk to those people that are being released and begin to set something up for them. If it's nothing but a Bible study once a week downtown at the courthouse, we're going to set it up. Okay? So uh, be in prayer for that because we want to reach the people who need to be reached. Amen? Amen. This is a hospital for the hurting, not a club for members. Okay? This is, this is not that way. And so when we give money, we're able to actually do that. We're able to get into the community. We're able to provide resources to people. And we're able to help them. And we're able to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, which that's what he's called us to be. And so thank you for your faithfulness to give. So our tithes and offerings this morning, and then we'll take our missions offering just a few, just a few moments. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come before you thanking you, God, for everything that you have done for us.
God, we thank you for placing us in this place. Lord, we thank you for giving us this facility. God, we thank you for working through each one of us. And God, we pray now that you would use these finances. You would meet the needs of the church. And God, you would help us to meet the needs of the people. Help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to be your ambassadors to the lost and the hurting in this community. And Father, we'll give you the thanks and we'll give you the praise for it in your mighty and your holy name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you as you give this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness to give. Convoy of Hope, uh, we've talked about it uh, for quite some time now, for a little over a month. And I, I want to show you one more time what Convoy of Hope does in the different places that they're in. Folks, they're in 140 different countries. It's amazing to me to see how many people they help. Not only do they help in the United States, they go worldwide. Uh, so please watch this. Take a look. And this is when I was in Haiti. Hey there, WFA community. It's Pastor Dave. Standing here with Boniface. And uh, he is one of the kids that Convoy of Hope is helping here in our orphanage that we stopped at today. And uh, we've seen so many different kids that Convoy has helped. Uh, kids who've been displaced by natural disasters, whose families just cannot even support them. And uh, Convoy is helping them in such a huge way. Uh, they're feeding over 90,000 kids a day. Uh, through their feeding programs that they have uh, in the country here. And uh, you always ask me why we support missions, why we give to missions like Convoy of Hope. This is why, because Christianity, it's a lot bigger than we are. And if we're not being the message of Christ, then we're honestly not being the message at all. So I'd encourage you uh, to continue to give, to keep going in everything that you're doing uh, for our missions and uh, be ready for what's about to come. Thanks. So when we look at Convoy of Hope and what they do in Haiti, and uh, folks, I want to tell you it's nothing short of miraculous what they're doing there. And we give to Convoy to change their life. And honestly, one day's wage, one day's wage changes their entire outlook. Uh, and I know just as far as uh, I was talking to uh, a couple of you, I think it's about two weeks ago when we were figuring out what your day's wage would be. And uh, 
And so I was curious, you know, what, what the day's wage would be. And so I, I, if you take a normal employee who makes about 35 to $40 a day, okay, uh, a, a wage laborer wastes 35, 40 bucks a day, and they work six days a week, okay? And uh, that one day, that 35 to $40, would have fed one of those kids three square meals a day, provided lodging for them for an entire month. And you think about, okay, so 30 bucks, 35, 40 bucks, provides lodging and provides three square meals a day. How much do we spend ourselves on pop or on a cup of coffee? I love Starbucks coffee. I love caramel macchiatos. But in my $5.23 caramel macchiato that I would go through and I would drive through a Starbucks and get, not to count the gas that I spent to drive to Starbucks to get it and all that, how much food, how many people could I have fed for one coffee drink that I'm going to down in about 10 minutes. And you begin to look at stuff in perspective like that. And that's not me trying to guilt you into giving. It's just trying to place some perspective. When I was in Haiti, I got a caramel macchiato in Haiti. It cost me 94 cents. That let me know I was paying way too much at Starbucks because it was a much better cup of coffee. But they do so much with the money that they get. You saw the big pot of rice that cost about 65, 70 cents to make. But they have to have the rice. And so a convoy brings into that big, huge warehouse there, and that goes all the way through the entire country of Haiti. They fill it up every month. They empty it out completely every month to meet the needs of those kids. So I'm encouraging you this morning to give to our one day Sunday. Why do we give to missions? We want to create missions and this is this is my missions message to you this morning. Let's start with the little kids. Kids BGMC, why do we give to BGMC? Because folks, honestly, if we create a a, a culture in our kids of selflessness, we will keep our adults from becoming selfish. If we keep them, if we create a culture of selflessness and giving to something that is outside of yourself and something that's greater than you, when they grow to be adults, they will not be selfish in what they have. And they will not circle the wagons and instantly grab their wallets and hold on to it when someone starts to pronounce a need that's there. And so I want you to understand that. Why do we do Speed the Light? Folks, we had a Speed the Light gathering this past week. Jamie Montero was here, and he shared his heart. We talked to some missionaries in Indonesia. And, uh, folks, I'm telling you, why are teenagers give? Well, if we create a culture of giving in our teenagers, they will be men and women who are selfless in their giving. And they will continue to give, and they will see a much bigger picture and they will begin to rally behind missions and the mission of Christ. Because the Great Commission does not stop outside of our church door. It just begins there. We're all walking in the Great Commission. And we may never get to go to Indonesia. We may never get to go to Russia. We may never get to go to Africa. We may never get to go to Haiti. I may never get to step foot back on Haitian soil again. But I know I can impact Haiti by my giving. Why do we give as adults? It's not just so we can have a fun offering on the third week of the month. That's not why we do it. We give because we need to continue to keep in perspective that missions are far greater than we are, that Christianity is far greater. And the whole purpose of the church is to spread the message of Jesus Christ. It's not to pat us on the back. And I've told our people in Springfield and I've told our people in Iowa that our, that our authorities in Iowa, our, our superintendents and our, our presbyters are like, I don't want a plaque. Take the $47 you would spend on a plaque and give it to a missionary. We don't need that kind of recognition. 
And folks, it's about the message of Jesus Christ. It's always been about the message, and it will continue to be about the message of Jesus Christ. That's why we do missions. Ushers, if you would, I want you to come. We're going to give our missions offering now, and I, I, I was going to take a second one for one day Sunday, but I think I just want to put all of our mission stuff together today. Okay, so this is our mission offering. Now, if you have made a faith promise to a missionary, I encourage you to keep it because they live off those. When we choose not to pay, when we choose not to fully fund a missionary, what we're saying is that your work isn't important enough to us to get you the money. And those missionaries, they are working hard over there everywhere they go. Look at our board on the outside. Look at all the missionaries that are there, all the things that we do. Read those boards back there. Look at what they do there. Are you able to do that? If we're not, we need to empower them to be able to do it. And we don't want them to have to worry, are they going to have enough money to make budget so they can actually do the work God's called them to do? We want them to be able to be blessed as they work. So this morning on the one day Sunday, if you've got that envelope, you can put your one day Sunday in that offer in that offering envelope. Place that in there, <clears throat> or your regular missions giving this morning. You can put that in there as well in the in the offering as it comes by. And if you're like, oh well, you know, I forgot, I forgot about giving to missions. I forgot it was Mission Sunday. Make a way to get it. Make a way to give to missions. If for some reason you forgot, let me know you forgot or let Sevilla know you forgot so we can say, okay, because the banks are closed tomorrow. It's President's Day. And so you guys can come in and you can bring that in and we can still get it to where it needs to go. But this is important. Folks, we have no idea about the lives that we're about to touch with this offering. That little boy... I shared with you, Boniface, he had not worn clothes until he was five years old. That pair of pajamas, that was the first set of clothes that kid had worn because he couldn't stand anything to touch his body because of what was happened to him as a child, as an infant. All those kids that you saw in there, those are orphan kids. Those are kids who had no mom, had no dad. The orphanage directors were their mom and dads. Those faces that you see, they're not nameless. They have souls. They have names. And each one of them deserves to fulfill the potential that God's placed in their life. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, God, thanking you for Convoy of Hope. God, we thank you for our missionaries throughout the entire world. God, we thank you for our missionaries that are in the U.S. We thank you for our missionaries who are uh, overseas. God, we thank you for missionaries in countries that are sensitive. God, that are in harm's way. And Father, we pray that you would keep them safe, God. Put your hand of safety on them. Protect them, God, and help them to fulfill your mission. And, Lord, we give you the thanks for it. We give you the praise for them, God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything that you're doing. And we pray it in your mighty and your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you as you give this morning.
Thank you, guys. And uh, we will report how much that was uh, next week, how much we gave to One Day Sunday. Uh, another cool thing about that is when we take part in that offering, what happens at Convoy of Hope is that our name is placed on a list for missions projects. Now, what that means is that they will call me and say, hey, Pastor, we have need of a six- or seven-member missions team that needs to go to a particular country. And uh, we need them to work for about 10 days in the country. Can you pull a team of missionaries together of your, from your church body and come and, and do this missions project for us? And so what is cool is that opens up different ministry outlets to us, and uh, it, it's amazing. So uh, just be in prayer for that. Uh, I don't know, how many of you, just out of curiosity, let me just ask you this question. How many of you would be interested in taking a church-wide missions trip to a particular country? Whoa, everybody just shuts their hands. Okay, we got a few here. Okay, all right, all right. So we got, we got hands up. Okay, great, all right. So <clears throat> be, be uh, paying attention because when we, we do this, I like humanitarian trips, but I like gospel trips a lot better. And I like being able to mix stuff up, give people water and give people food for their spirit too. I like, it. I like doing it that way. It's good. Uh, so be, be on the lookout. I'll be sharing some stuff with you as time goes along here uh, on some missions trips. Uh, it's been asked, you know, it's been pushed around there for uh, one for Indonesia, one for the Philippines, another one to Haiti, uh, one for the Dominican Republic, uh, and then several in South America. And uh, so it's going to be kind of fun. And a couple in Russia and one in India. So there's missions projects all over the place. Uh, so it'll be, be good times. Well, this morning, I, I want to share something. I want to start off by reading a scripture to you. Uh, and it's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. And it's a story that gets kind of neglected sometimes in scripture. Uh, you ever notice there's some parts of scripture you can read and just read really quick and you think you got it and then you just kind of just shotgun on through that? Uh, and then when you go back at it, God really lays something into your heart. And you're like, oh, wow, that was actually there. And I missed it. This is one of those stories. And uh, in Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, we see that Jesus is going to the house of Martha. And Martha's busy with all the preparations and all the working to make everything Perfect. All right, let's read. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work to myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha. I'm going to add a third one there. Martha, Martha, Martha. The Lord said, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed, only one. Many, or excuse me, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Now, this scripture, this story is overlooked a lot of times in scripture because we think it only has one meaning. But a lot of times, the meanings that we put on things are very superficial. You know, if we take the initial instant meaning off here, do the most important thing. Okay, so there we go. And, uh, and that's the fastest sermon ever, and so we're done. All right, let's. There's more there. If you read just before that in Luke chapter 10, you see that Jesus had just sent out the 72 and they came back and they gave their reports that even the demons of hell came and they shook and they, they were subject to him and to all of them. And so there was a revival going out of a realization of authority over things. 
And Jesus said, don't count it a, don't, don't look at it yourself highly because the demons fall underneath your authority. But rather do the important thing. It's because of me. That your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Lives. It, it, it's me that you need to be thankful for. I gave you the authority. Where do you think it came from? And so when we get to this, it, let, let's look at the dynamic here, because this is kind of funny, because this one, how many of you have a sister? Anybody got older sister? Older sister, okay. Or a younger sister, maybe, you know, how many of you could identify with either Mary or Martha in this story? You, you have that ability. If you have a brother, you probably could do the same thing. You identify with either one or the other here. You either identify with Mary or you identify with Martha. And so it's kind of interesting. Let's start out with Martha. Martha actually opened her home to Jesus. Okay? That's a good thing. That's a plus, right? I've read, read this scripture a lot of times, and it just hit me that she actually is the one who said, Oh, you could come to my house. That will be more beneficial to you in a moment. She actually opened up her home to him and the disciples. No doubt she had heard of all the things that were going on, right? These 72 are coming back. You know, probably some of them are from where she lived. And she's hearing all the stories and thought, well, I had the opportunity to have these people in my house. So let's open it up. You know, a lot of times, we can get that way too. We can get so hung up in what we've heard and the hype about somebody or something, and we just open our home up. That can be kind of dangerous. It can be kind of dangerous. And now here it wasn't dangerous because it was Jesus. But you end up opening your home up why did she do it, though? Was it, what was the motive? And, and that we don't know. We would have to just conjecture that, that why she was there, why she asked Jesus to come, why she opened her home to the disciples. We, we would just have to ask ourselves why and then speculate as to the answer. But you can see from her actions that it might not necessarily have been a because Jesus was Jesus, it might have just been because she wanted to make a good example. So she looked good. Think about it. She looked good. So then we have Mary. And Mary sat at Jesus' feet, listening to what he was saying. You can judge a lot about a person by the way they act, right? So if we look at verse 40, it kind of lets us in on the motive of Martha. Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Martha was trying to make everything perfect. What she was doing is she has forgotten the fact that she has Jesus standing in her house. And if Jesus is somewhere... Everything else is inconsequential. She hasn't taken the opportunity to stop and stand in front of Jesus and listen to the words that he's teaching because it would absolutely change her life. But folks, a lot of times we end up being just like Martha. We will worry ourselves with the preparation and we'll worry ourselves with all the details so much so that we forget about the whole purpose of it anyway. How many times have we missed miracles and we've missed blessings because we were too hung up in the details? Now understand, this is not saying don't be organized. This is not saying don't keep your house. It's not saying anything like that. What this is saying is that we need to understand when we have the audience of the king. We need to understand when he's standing in our house. And... Quit messing around with the details. I'll give you an example. 
Did you know the number one place where ladies make their grocery list is not at home, it's in church? Proven. Proven. Grocery list in church. I found that in statistics. I don't know what you're talking about over there. I just... But the number one place where people make plans is in church. You get that point in your life where you have learned how to tune people out around you, and you've learned to do two or three things at the same time. You're listening, and you're looking, and you're writing. You know, maybe you're correcting a, your, one of your kids, or you're digging in your purse for a Lego that just happens to be there, you know. I used to carry little Lego men in my pocket for my kids. You know, and I could talk to you and I could play Legos with my kids. Yeah, and then I kick him, you know, the Lego guy. I guess that's the dad thing in me, but you can get so hung up in all these details and distractions in our life that we forget the whole purpose that we're sitting here in the first place. We forget the whole purpose of coming in for worship. And so, folks, I'm telling you, it's hard, to be, it's hard to be Mary when we're so busy being Martha. We're so busy being Martha that it's difficult for us to be Mary because Jesus has already said Mary chose the better thing. It's interesting, though, because she's really hurt. She's really hurt because she said, don't you care that my sister is sitting here and I'm doing all the work? I was really thinking Jesus would look back and go, did I ask you to do that? A lot of times we assume a whole lot. We assume so much in our life that, that we think, okay, everything has to be just so before I could go to church or before I could ever do anything for the Lord. I got to do this, A, B, C, and Z before the rest of it will actually come to pass and, and work. So I got to get all the details right and then everything will be made right and then I can hear from the Lord. Folks, it's not right. It will bring chaos to your life. It's like trying to nail jello to a wall is getting all your details right. You might get it to stick for a second, but then it's just going to fall. Then you get frustrated because nothing seems to be going your way. Nothing seems to be working, and we get aggravated at God. And he's saying, I didn't ask you to do that in the first place. And yet we're still hung up so much in, our, in, in all these details. And I'm a details person. I want to know. If we go on a missions trip, you will see me count, recount, count again. You will see me go through my manual like 16, 17 times before we even get on the plane the first time. I know where we're going, what we're doing, how to get there. I know all the numbers. I can talk to you in whatever language we're going to and get to where we need to go. I'm a detail guy. But folks, when it comes to hearing from the Lord, when it comes to sitting down in the presence of the king, all the details don't mean squat. And we need to stop with this. We have, been, we have placed so many limitations and restrictions on ourselves that we have become, we have, we have, it's not Satan that's hindering us, it's us. It's our own mind. It's our own life that we are hindering ourselves in an experience with God or from an experience with God because we got so many details to work out instead of just letting God be God. I was sitting at my desk thinking about something, uh, thinking about this, and every time I have ever felt like Martha... Every time I have felt like Martha, this has been what has happened. 
I was the one who actually volunteered. Every time I felt like that I had been taken advantage of or that I felt like that I had been unappreciated or, or something like that in doing something, I was the one that actually volunteered to do it. And then I asked myself the question, did I ask God if I should have done that in the first place? On very few occasions, I'm sorry to say that I said yes to that and said, oh, yeah, I actually talked to God, and that was okay. Normally, it's I'm good at that, I could do that, and so I'm going to do it. And so I volunteer. Now, I'm not saying that you don't volunteer for stuff. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is make sure that what you're doing is edifying the kingdom of God instead of bringing glory to yourself. Because, folks, I'll tell you, we need nursery volunteers. You're like, oh, I don't feel called to nursery. I just want to tell you, don't feel called to nursery isn't an excuse. It's not an excuse. I, 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 a children's ministry. You know, I, I feel called to children's ministry. Okay. Great. Let's go. Oh, but not that kind. You know, a lot of us, we begin to start placing other limitations. And we're like, okay, yep, I'm going to step in this. God's told me to do it. And it's like, now I want you to volunteer in nursery. Oh, Lord, I need to pray and listen to you some more. Are you sure? We need you know, children's volunteers, youth volunteers, all these different things that we, we have in our churches that are, that are active ministries. Folks, it is not babysitting. Worship. Folks, I will tell you, worship ministry in this church is important. It's important, and God has been speaking to some of you, but you're hung up, and you're like, I can't do it. Because, ah, I don't know that I'm called to do it. But every time you see it, and every time you're sitting there, God's actually speaking to you, saying, yeah, you should do that. How much more call do you need? So you got to actually ring your phone? If so, give me your number, and I'll text you. But he's called us to do so much. But we can't do exactly what he's called us to do because we've clouded ourselves with so many other details. Called us with so many other details. And it's when we start to clarify those things and really begin to focus on what's important that we really truly see something happen. You know, I don't know how many of you have thought this, and this is where we get hung up in our details a lot of times. Anybody ever think if I need something done right, I might as well do it what? Myself, right? Because can't nobody do it like me. And folks, I will tell you that is a dangerous thought because it will trap you. And it will keep you bound down and held down and away from what God is wanting you to do because you think you got to do it all. And I will tell you, it's the most freeing thought in your mind that, you know what? I don't have to do it all myself. It's like a 300-pound weight getting lifted off your shoulder when you realize, oh, wow, you mean God's actually called somebody else to do something too? Fantastic! Then you're able to work with somebody, get it done three times faster and then you got more time ever wonder why scripture says that God justifies or redeems the time that's why when we try to go it alone thing we throw so many details in that there's no way God can move because he doesn't, he doesn't fit into our schedule at 1103 Martha is so hung up in details in her home and making this just right, you know, the, the, the hummus has got to be just right. The bread has got to be just so and unleavened, and, and it's got to be just fantastic. 
and it's got to be cooked just right. You've got to get the kiln in the oven just right to make the bread go. We've got to roast the lamb. It's got to be just right. She's ho hung up in that. Is it a bad thing to have details? No, it's not. But it's a really bad thing when the details become so much of our life that all we can see is details and we can't see the reason for it. So you should volunteer. Make sure you volunteer. Let me ask, I always wondered what happened before this scene in the Bible. Let me give you a hypothetical, okay? It's hypothetical. It's not scriptural at all. Just a hypothetical. Think about it. Give you something to think about today. Mary and Martha. Why was Mary sitting down at Jesus' feet in the first place? And here's why I think. Let's see if you think it works out this way. Mary, more than likely, at the beginning of the day, when they first found out Jesus was coming, tried to help Martha. Okay? Tried to help Martha. But then Martha came and said, No, you can't do that. You're doing it wrong. <clears throat> Folks, I have been, I was mopping a floor at a church one time. I didn't realize there was more than one way to use a mop. I had a Navy guy show me how to use a mop. And I figured if it's good enough for the surface of aircraft carrier, it's good enough for church. So that's the way I was doing it. I had a guy come up to me and said, you're mopping wrong. So I'm like, mopping wrong? What are you talking about? I started at that end. I'm working this way. I'm keeping clean water in the bucket. I've you know, got all this. I'm doing it. Hey, you're mopping wrong. I'm like, here you go. Well, no, you're just mopping wrong. I was wanting to show me. Educate me, please. But he was just wanting to point out a mistake. And folks, I wasn't mopping wrong. I was mopping right. But Martha, you know, she, she was telling Mary she was doing it wrong. Then Mary, Mary probably got a little bit aggravated. Well, if you think you can do better, Martha... Then go right ahead. Now, folks, I, I will tell you, sadly enough, this plays out in churches, too. Folks try to do something, and then somebody, uh, pff, did you see her attempt at that? Did you see his attempt? Did you see him try to run a broom? What in the world? Was he born a barn? He does know you actually push the vacuum, right? Instead of pull it? I've had somebody tell me that too. Well, you've got to make sure you push the vacuum to make sure it vacuums. You can't just pull it. I'm sorry, I missed that in the instruction manual. I should probably go read again. I thought, you know, you turn it on, it sucked up stuff, and you didn't matter which way you went. You go with the, wherever the carpet goes, that's the way you go. I guess I was mistaken. But Mary probably got a bit aggravated and said, if you think you can do better, do it yourself. Since I'm not doing a good enough job. I don't know how it happened with you guys. Anybody ever experienced that first off? Has it just been me? Somebody tells you how to do Oh, nobody's there. Okay. Well, folks, I want to share one thing with you. My brother will kill me because I'm going to share it. But my mom used to run a catering company. And uh, it was nothing for us to get called during the day, like a couple days before, saying, hey, we've got this, this uh, event. We want you guys to cater for it. It's so many people. And then my brother and I would go, and we would set up tables, and we'd get everything set up, all the place settings set up, all the chafing dishes, all those all those different things, we get that stuff set up. Well, on this day, we go in, and my mother calls me and Steve into the room. She said, boys, we have 175 people 
in about, uh, and we need you to go there tomorrow morning and set up. She gave us a schedule. And I'm like, okay. And so we went and we set up. Now, this was a little bit famous. This was a three-fork meal, okay? This was, you know, you had the dessert fork and the, the salad and the, and the main entree fork. You had two knives, three glasses. I mean, this was a big deal. And so, you know, fancy, fancy dinner. And so we go in and we start setting up, and I set the tables up. So my brother had no problem letting me set the tables up since they were heavy, not the white plastic ones that are actually light, but these things weighed like 100 pounds a piece. But I get the tables all set up, and then we go and we start throwing linens on the table, and we put all the linens on the table, and then my brother starts working on one side of the room doing place settings, and I go on the other side of the room, and I'm, we're working toward the middle. We're working toward the line. And so I'm working, and I get about nine or, you know, eight or nine things done. Look over, my brother has three done. And, folks, this is the kind of thing. My mom, when she did catering, she was exact. She gave us rulers, and the cups had to be a certain amount of inches away from the plates. And you had to, and I don't know if you've ever seen that, it, I had a four and three-quarter inch ruler that I would put at the base of the plate, and I would slide my finger all the way around in a circle with that, and that's the area that you had to work with. And so we would slide those things in there. We'd set those cups up, all these different things. I got mine up. My brother came over to where I was and said, you're setting this up all wrong. And I'm like, you just need to leave me alone. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. He said, this looks terrible. And I'm like, well, set one for me then. Show me what I'm doing wrong. He said it. It looked exactly like the plate that I had just set before. And he goes around and he sets it, and there's only two forks on the plate setting. And I'm like, this is a three-fork meal, not two. No, it's not. I'm like, call mom. <laughs> he called mom. Yeah, it's a three-fork three meal. Oh. And he came over and said, what's well, still wrong? And then I got irritated. So I'm like, it's not wrong. It's right. You just don't want to admit you were wrong and that I'm doing it right. And so we start an argument. I don't know. Anybody ever fought with your sibling? I, I don't know. I have. But we go back and forth over something stupid, which is about a quarter of an inch. Stupid. And so now the event started at 7, okay? And we had a schedule. At 6.15... The food was to come in. At 6.50, uh, everything had to be right, and we had to actually, uh, our guests were coming in at 6.50 to take their seats. All the place settings had to be set. Carts had to be at the, the setting. All those different things had to be there. Then at 7 o'clock, the dinner would be served. At 7, uh, uh, excuse me, 7 o'clock, then the dinner would be served. Okay, so we, we get all that stuff going. But I got so aggravated at my brother, I stopped what I was doing. I dropped my set of plates, and I said, if you think you can do better, do it yourself. And I walked out. And I walked out of the back of the, out of the hotel, and I stepped out. Now, this is the part that my brother didn't really know. My brother never really asked for details some. But um, the people that were coming, uh, it was the governor of the state of Tennessee, three more uh, senators from the state, or excuse me, two senators from the state, and then some representatives from Washington, and some of their delegates, and then the people that were at the college. And then, you know, so we had a, quite a few of the high priority people coming into there. And now my brother has to set all the place settings for the rest of those tables, and he is running and setting them up like, I don't know, turtles through molasses pretty much. That's about how fast he's going. And I wasn't going to go back in until he apologized to me and admitted he was wrong. 
And I set out on the loading dock, just sitting there thinking how funny it's going to be when the governor comes in and sees that only, you know, nine tables are set. And my brother's standing there with a tray full of dishes trying to get everything set up. But then something else happened. I started thinking about the end result. What's that going to do to my mom's catering business? I better get in there. But this is what happened. We got there, and I, I made that little epiphany about 6.50 when the food was supposed to get there. Food's getting there. My mom's employees are coming, bringing that stuff in. They're setting it up. Instantly, my mom goes through the roof and says, why are these not set? You guys have been working on this for four hours. Why are they not set? And I said, ask Steve. So I took off, and I, I did like any, any youngest child would do. I ran to uh, go hobnob with the governor. And so I ran out and met the governor, met all the, sen the senators and the representatives, and told them we'd be eating shortly. And they started coming in. We're still setting tables at that moment. Everybody went on panic alert. Came in, and the governor's walking in. I'm, I'm escorting him to the head table. Set him down there. The head table, thank the Lord, had been set. And so they're sitting there. And my brother walks up to the governor and says, I'm sorry that the tables and things aren't done yet. And said that he was sorry the tables weren't done yet, but my brother was supposed to help me set it up. To which the governor replied, well, I wanted to do a buffet anyway. But it's details. Some details. We get so hung up in being right and so hung up in our own detail and how important that one detail happens to be that we miss out on so much stuff. My brother and I were at each other for months after that. We were trying to find ways to make each other fail at the catering business. I would, he, he would set, try to get a whipped cream canister and, you know, we do the homemade stuff. And I would take and I would put salt instead of sugar in his whipped cream. And he would wonder why the thing would, like, explode off the end of the end of it because it had too much stuff inside it. And, and then he would, he would switch out. He switched out hot sauce and ketchup for me, <clears throat> which wasn't too bad because we were catering a fried chicken event, and hot sauce on fried chicken is good. Very, try it. You'll love it. But you get into there, and, and you start getting so hung up and being right that you've forgotten exactly why you're there. My mom almost lost money on that deal with the governor. And then our little antics going back and forth. They didn't really hurt anybody. But I was so hung up and being right that I was doing a poor job at everything else. The other thing that happens here is that you get stressed when you start getting hung up in the details. Anybody ever got stressed in the details? How many ladies ever planned a wedding? I never really realized how many details there were in a wedding until we started planning ours. And I'm like, we got to pick colors? <laughs> Invitations? Well, we're just going to tell everybody to come, right? <laughs> What's an RSVP card anyway? And there's a lot of details there, but you can get so stressed out that you will miss your own wedding because of details. You will just show up and be a zombie at your own wedding. You're there and you're wondering exactly why 
your ushers are not wearing their little ascots that you told them to wear. And you're doing, you're thinking that as you're walking down the aisle, you're like, oh, can't believe, can't believe they wore that. She is wearing a necklace with that dress. I told her not to wear anything with that. That's just, mm. And you get so hung up in that that you miss the occasion. You miss the occasion. Stress does some crazy stuff to us. We're not supposed to stress. Stress is not from God. It's from the enemy. Stress is not from God. Some interesting facts about stress you may not know. Stress is called the silent killer. Okay? Okay? It's estimated that two-thirds of the deaths in the United States are stress-related in some way. Stress in our lives causes a hormone to be produced in the brain. And if that hormone, uh, that hormone that's produced causes our blood sugar to go out of whack and drop, it causes mood swings, fatigue, and inflammation. You ever been around somebody that's been stressed out? What's the first? They get catty real quick, right? Don't talk to me right now. I'm stressed. I got all this stuff going on in my life right now. Just leave me alone. I just want to go eat something. What's the first thing we go to when we get stressed out? We head to the refrigerator and Katie bar the door if there's anything in there that is near the expiration date. And we will sit there. We see a cheesecake and we're like, mm hmm. You're mine. And we take out our stress and our emotions on this cheesecake. And then it's like, mm-hmm, I got you. You now have a blood sugar of 712. You can barely move. You can't even blink. It's all in slow motion. It seems odd. Why would we do that? We would tell our kids not to do that. But we get stressed out and we do it ourselves. We have a mood swing or we get in a mood. Or then we start getting sick. We're like, oh man, my back is acting up. I can barely walk. My hip feels like it's about to go out. My knees are messed up. My toes hurt. Even my ears are swollen. I don't know what's going on. All because of stress. Stress causes growth issues in children because it impacts a pituitary gland in kids. Chronic stress kills brain cells. It kills brain cells at the same rate as an illegal drug. Let me say that one one more time. Chronic stress kills brain cells at nearly the same level as an illegal drug. Stress causes irritable bowel syndrome. Causes it to flare up, gives you diarrhea real bad. Some of you are wondering what IBS was. I just want to tell you. But it causes those things in your life. It causes those things in your body because your body is not supposed to be under stress. Causes insomnia and other sleep disorders. All of that stress, all of that anxiety. Up to 80% of stress is self-induced, though. Up to 80% of the stress that we go through in our life is self-induced. It's when we've got so much concentration on the details that we can't see straight. Satan's main goal in our life is to get us focused off the things that God wants us to be focused on, right? Is to get us to turn our mind away from those. His lead card for every single person is to keep us busy. And he will keep us busy, 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 and busy so we can't focus on what God has wanted us to do. He wants to keep us out of the church, so what does he do? He makes us busy. And so we're like too busy to go to church. We're too busy to read our Bible. We're too busy to pray. We're too busy to go check on somebody that's around us. We're too busy to pick up a phone. We're too busy to send a text message even though it only takes 3.2 seconds to send a 15 or 20 word text message if you are a teenager. 
5.2 if you are an adult. He wants to keep us busy. He wants to get us so hung up in the details in our life that we don't see him. Well, so am I supposed to ignore my life, Pastor? Is that what I'm supposed to No. Don't ignore your life, but recognize the distraction when one comes. Recognize the distraction when one comes. Here's something that you need to be aware of. Satan also sometimes uses good things to distract you. Think about it. Is it a good thing to volunteer at all these different places and organizations? Yes, it's a good thing to volunteer. Get involved. There's tons of different things to get involved with. When does that distraction, or when does volunteering become a distraction? When you begin to place it over everything else. And it begins to take center part in your life, and that's all you ever seem to do. Becomes a distraction. Satan sometimes uses those good things to distract you. Might look good on the outside, but on the inside it's something different. If you think about it, look at look at Adam and Eve. When Eve was in the garden, what did what did Satan do? He said he told her, he said, Look at this fruit. You won't surely die. It looks so good. How could that kill you? He didn't mean you'd really die. And he deceived. He got her distracted because she had heard the very words of God that says, don't eat of this tree or you will die. Distraction actually created the first sin. It's interesting. So we got to be smarter than the enemy. So... So we, we talk about all these distractions. So how do we, how do we outsmart him? Because, folks, I'm going to tell you, you know, we, I see shirts that say Satan's stupid, and I, I see stuff like that, and I, I understand the point of it, but that's not true. He's smart. He's been around a long time. He's been around the block a long, long time. But when it comes to this, how do we combat stress and distraction? Psalms 55, verse 22 and 23 says this, it says, cast your cares on the Lord and he'll sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. But you, God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay. The bloodthirsty and the deceitful will not live out half their days. But as for me, I'll trust you. We've got to cast our cares and these details that we don't necessarily know how to handle on the Lord because when we cast them on Him, He will sustain you. He will sustain you. And then God is there for you. Don't allow yourself to walk on by and get so confused and confounded by the things of the world. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7 says this. It says, humble yourself. Therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Anxiety. It's, this, it's the next step from stress. You get stressed and then you become anxious. And then you become depressed. Because you feel that anxiety lording over you. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. Verse 7 says it though. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God is there for you to place your anxiety on. Your thoughts of what others might think about you. He wants you to place those on him. Because if you place what others think about you on God. God will place what he thinks about on you. point <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 40 verse 29 through 31 says this he says it gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak 
Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Folks, this is what God wants us to do. Those, verse 31, when we hope in Him, when we hope in Him, He will renew our strength. We'll soar on wings like eagles. We'll run and not grow weary. We'll walk and we won't faint. He has given you all that you need to stand strong and not to get sidetracked. Yes, you'll get tired and maybe even fall someday. Maybe you'll make a mistake and fall, but you know what? Our hope is in the Lord. And He'll renew us and He'll refresh us every single day. Guard your heart and your time. Guard your heart and your time. Do things for the kingdom of God, not for credit for yourself. Philippians 4, verse, chapter 4, verse 6 through 7 says this. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is a promise for you and me. We don't have to be so worried. We don't have to be so worried because God has us. God has us. He has that situation. He has that family member who seems to be going off the rails right now. He, he has your job. He has your finances. He has every single part of you. All we have to do is turn it over to him. The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. Your spirit's guarded. You will stay focused on the things of God. Your minds can't be persuaded anything else. They can't be persuaded otherwise. And the last scripture here, Habakkuk. I like that book. It's a really good one. If you've never read it, you should go through and read it. It'll change your life. Chapter 3, verse 17 through 19 says this. It says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will be joyful in my Savior the sovereign Lord is my strength he makes my feet like the feet of a deer and enables me to tread on the heights Folks, what this is saying is that even in our life, in the times that are so terrible, the time when there's no fig tree, when there's no sweet fulfillment in our life, in the time in our life where there seems to be no grapes on the vines, there's, there's no fellowship, in the times that we seem like we're all by ourselves, the time that the olive crop fails, when, when everything that we seem to be trying isn't working, When the fields produce no food, there are no sheep in the pen. We have no meat, no nourishment. We just feel like we're so destitute. There's nothing that we could do. No cattle in the stall. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will be joyful in God my Savior. That is foreign to people, folks, because... They get so hung up in their details. They get so hung up in the, in the inconsequentials of life. And the, the inconsequentials seem so important to us. But they're really not. God is wanting us to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's Him. It's His message. It's, his, it's Him. We don't need to be Martha. We don't need to be Martha. Does Martha have worth? Is she valuable? Sure she is because she knows how to plan a party. But in the end, she planned the party and missed out on who it was for. And we don't need to be the same way. God has called us to do something far greater. He's called us to, to do so many different things in our life. Will you get past the inconsequentials? Will you get past the details and actually do them? And folks, I want to tell you this morning, a lot of us go through confusion in our life because we, we feel like we should be doing one thing in particular. 
but then another time we feel like, you know, we can't hear from the Lord. We feel like maybe somehow or another we've missed the Lord in our life. We feel like that, that you know, God told me this a long time ago, but then it stopped. A lot of times it never stopped. We just got so hung up in the details that we just stopped serving. It's not that God has taken our dreams away of what he wants us to do. We just got hung up in all the other stuff. When God has just called us to simply go, he's called us to do. If you think about it, the Great Commission in Mark, it says, go and make disciples, all of you. The very first part of that is just one two-letter word. It says, go. Go. It's a word of action. It's a word that requires us to do something. He didn't tell us which direction to go. He didn't say go north uh, or, or go west or go south or, or go east or go to this place or go to that place. He just simply said to go. Why? Why would he just say to go? Because it seems so simple. But that's exactly why he said just go. Because to just simply go means that you're going to step and you are going to be listening for Him to tell you where to take your next step. We're walking. God has placed you in church here to do. He's placed you in this community to do and to go. And He wants you to do it. Will you simply answer him and it doesn't matter well pastor I'm old you know what he simply says go he didn't say go at a breakneck speed he just simply says go go and make well pastor I'm old I can't I can't make as fast as everybody. My hands are, 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 are slower than they used to be. He just simply said, go and make. He didn't say how fast it would be. He just simply said, go. He just simply said, go. And we get hung up in the details of what going looks like. I don't know if you guys are like, <clears throat> when we get ready to go on a trip somewhere, it's a process. My wife has to plan. Where are we going? Where are we stopping? How much gas are we going to need? We're going to fill up three times. We're going to stop here, here, and here to fill up. That should be about halfway in there, and we've got to fill up that way going back. The hotel's right here. And then we're going to take our clothes, but we better take them in this so we can do this. We'll put them here. <clears throat> we just simply need to go. Yeah, we, we plan, and you're supposed to plan. You're not supposed to do anything just crazy and just, like, throw it out there. But didn't God call us to be a little spontaneous with ourselves, too? He's called us to go. What's he calling you to do? What's he calling you? What has he told you to do? And you're like, well, God, I can't do this yet because this isn't there. What's he called you to do? Start. Start something, start somewhere. It means to go, take one step in a direction, any direction. Take that step and just do it. Nike has it right. Just do it. Just do it. Well, Pastor, I'm not good at it. Doesn't matter. Because where you're weak, he's strong. Where you fail, He makes up the difference. He just simply called you to be a vessel and would you let Him use you? Simply go. And so this morning, I, I want to ask you this question and it's only going to be one. This morning, if you say, you know what, Pastor? I hear what you're saying. <clears throat> and I want to honor God with my life. I want to honor Him <clears throat> with everything that's in me. 
And I want to answer that call to go. I want to answer that call this morning to go. And so if you're in here and you hear the sound of my voice and even the ones that are watching us online right now, if you are here and you say, Pastor, I'm going to answer the call. I'm going to go. Whatever he tells me to do, I'm going to do it. Now, I don't want you to stand here in just a moment because someone's standing beside you. Because if somebody has to pull you up to get you to stand, you will fall when the time comes to actually move. Because you're not ready to stand. But this morning, if you say, Pastor, I'm going to answer that call. I'm going to go. I'm going to do what God's told me to do. I'm going to take a step in the right direction. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what the end result's going to be. All I know is that I'm going to take a step in the right direction. I'm going to take a step this morning and I'm going to stay today on February the 15th I started what I was supposed to do I began what I was supposed to do on February the 15th today if that's you right now you say pastor I'm going to answer that call in my life whatever God's telling me to do I'm going to do it if that's you stand to your feet right now I'm going to answer the call whatever God tells me to do I'm doing it don't stand because friends are standing. Stand because God has directed you to stand. Now, if you're here and you say, Pastor, I can't stand, but I want to. If something's keeping me from standing. Then I'm going to ask you this question. Ask you this question. If the reason why you're not standing because you don't know what to do or you haven't heard from the Lord, if you don't know what to do, but you want to go, you should be standing right now. Because God will make the things clear. He'll make those things clear to you. You don't have a clue. You could, you could not even know. All you know is you feel God's calling you for something, but you just feel that anticipation. You don't know what it is. God is saying, I'm calling you. Take a step and get ready because I'm about to speak to you. And this one is, it's not about how old you are. You could be a teenager, you could be a child, you could be an adult, you could be a senior citizen, it doesn't matter. God does not say you cannot go and make or go and do simply because of your age. It's never a factor. You don't see it anywhere in Scripture. God used Methuselah. And he is an old man. God used David and he was a teenager. God used Jesus and he was a baby. Think about it. He can use you. He can use you. God, you see the ones who are standing right now. And Father, I pray right now that you would just let them feel that, that urgency in their spirit. And God, that you are worthy to be praised. God, that you are the one that is calling them to go. And God, we give you thanks for it. We give you praise for it right now, God. Thank you for what's about to happen, God, in our church, in the lives of the people that are here. Lord, I thank you for it, God. And Lord, we just know that you are going to do something incredible through the people that are here. Father, I pray for the ones that don't feel like they can stand. God, I pray that you would do what Scripture says in, 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 in Ezekiel, God, where it says, strengthen what remains. Stand and strengthen, God. Lord, strengthen the bones. Help them to stand. Help them to know what you want to do in their life, God. And we give you thanks for it in your mighty name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's worship together just, just for a moment. God is in control of everything. He's the almighty God. Let's worship together. Just put your hands, just raise your hands this morning. Let's worship together. You are in control. You hold everything. So I'm letting go. Releasing all my fears, surrendering my heart 
to you and you alone. No other God is worthy of my praise. No other name is higher than your name. Almighty, most holy, can stand against the power of your grace the kindness of your hand in the middle of it all you are reigning strong forever your word stands no other God is worthy of my praise. No other name is higher than your name. Almighty, most holy God, you are the only. we thank you for what's about to happen God we thank you Lord Jesus that you are in our life God and we ask that you would just guide us tell us where to step God we'll go lead our step wherever you have for us God Lord we'll go and Lord Jesus we pray Lord that you would just continue to guide us Lord we pray that through this week, God, you would open opportunities for us to share your, your name and your, your love with people. And God, we know that you are in control. And God, we pray now that you would guide us, keep your hand on us, Lord, protect us and lead us. And we pray all this in your mighty and your holy name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys.